Welcome back. So we're talking about this new document, this Roadmap 2030, that describes how control theory is going to be central for addressing societal scale challenges in the next decade and beyond. And this uh, chapter that I'm gonna talk about right now, chapter five, is all about how to actually translate this into kind of industrial scale applications through technology validation and translation. So this is something I think is super duper important, something um, kind of I know a lot of the controls community has been passionate about for a long time. So most of the great control theorists I know actually apply their theory in practice on actual industrial problems. And this is talking about how we can kind of accelerate and broaden those efforts. So if we really want to solve some of these societal uh, scale challenges like climate change, um, you know, making our power grid more resilient, things like that, we have to have technology that is, you know, bomb proof, ironclad, and is definitely validated and going to work in uh, these industrial applications. So this is a great quote um, that is quoted in this roadmap by Stephen Lowe. The gap between theory and practice is a lot bigger in practice than in theory. And I think that's really um, a clever way of saying that there is a long way to go between what we do in kind of mathematical control theory and the scale of you know, deployed solutions that we need uh, at scale for industrial uh, control. And this is a really cool table from, again, this roadmap that illustrates just kind of how large some of these, uh, some of these different kind of markets and industrial sectors are. So, you know, automotive control, for example, this is a, a $63 billion uh, volume of sales per year, um, percent growth over here. So this is uh, kind of useful information if you're thinking, you know, what are the sectors that are really big and growing? How fast are they growing? You know. Uh, kind of what do they look like. So I think this is really helpful for me also when I think about developing new technology, you know, to understand what the trends are and where things are going. Um, this is pretty useful. So there are also recommendations for um, essentially how you actually um, get the research community, kind of the academic controls community, to make technology that is more useful and more broadly applicable in industry and can be validated. I'm not going to read this off for you, but this is pretty useful. These are 10 messages for the control research community. Um, this is from another document that was reprinted with permission. Um, but you know, for th example, number three I think is super important. Real world success requires domain understanding. This is true in all fields of academic research, not just in control theory. This is also true in machine learning and data science. If you have skills like control theory, like machine learning, and you want to go into someone else's domain, whether that's biological systems or the power grid, if you don't either work with someone who has a domain knowledge, respect that domain knowledge, or yourself build that domain knowledge in that field, you're really uh, going to be hamstringing yourself and limiting your future success. So I think that's really, really important. Real world success requires domain understanding and respecting uh, that deep domain knowledge. Problems are hard or else they would have been solved. And you're not just going to come in uh, and kind of solve everyone's problems with control theory if you don't understand what their real challenges are. Okay, and there's a lot of good recommendations here. That's just one that jumped out to me. Okay, so this chapter is really thinking about how is this transition from these kind of emerging methodologies and new control techniques, how do we get these new um, you know, methodologies of control into industrial solutions in a way that they really are robust, they really do solve problems. Okay, a lot of good recommendations here. Similarly, some cool kind of just uh, ways of understanding the process of validation. So one of the really key takeaways in this entire chapter, um, I said it at the beginning and we're going to see it much more um, in the, the second half of this video, is validation and benchmarks are essential for demonstrating that technology is ready to transition into kind of actual prime time industrial scale uh, uses. Okay, so before my little control theory widget is on every self-driving car, you know, across the world, it had better been validated and benchmarked and test rigorously by the community in an open and transparent way. So that's one of the things that this chapter really advocates is the need for benchmark validation systems that allow us to move the field forward. Um, and so this is just kind of one uh, cool graphic from this chapter on kind of the process of validation. 
solution uh, from fundamentals to applications to prototype in this kind of theory to application uh, progression. And maybe I'll just talk a little bit about some of those um, benchmarks because I think that'll be pretty useful. Um, so, so what are some of the desired features of a validation infrastructure that allows us to take our academic theoretical work and move it into the kind of uh, industrial scale problems? And maybe I'll make a point here. This is important. This is a huge community. Control theorists, there are you know, tons and tons of people practicing control theory, all the way from the extremely mathematical, essentially you know, mathematicians whose problem space happens to be dynamical systems and controls optimization, all the way to extremely applied researchers who are actually implementing you know, control uh, solutions on hardware in industrial settings, okay? And there's this huge progression, and one person doesn't have to be able to do all of it. That's actually one of the, the, the most important things about benchmark systems and validation infrastructure is it allows people at different progressions, at different technical readiness levels to talk to each other. And so if I'm on the very applied side, I can grab methodologies on the very pure side. And if I'm on the very pure side, I can kind of interface and have my technology move towards towards the more industrial side without me being one of those industrial experts. And so these are some of the um kind of key takeaways summarized in this chapter. Things you need your validation benchmark infrastructure to have. You need to have fidelity. You need your test bed to be as close to the real world environment as possible while still maintaining the fact that it's a test bed, it's tractable, it's low cost, it's fast to prototype on, things like that. And so sometimes that might mean that there is a hierarchy of fidelities. You might have you know, a low fidelity model that you really rapidly prototype on and then you move up in fidelity. So you kind of have your, your different control strategies move up in fidelity until they reach test beds that really are as accurate as possible. This is what we do um, in aviation with flight simulators. There's a whole range of graded uh, fidelities of flight simulators, and you use different ones for different uh, validation, uh, kind of for, for different validation necessities. Okay, repeatability. This again is not just specific to control theory. This is for you know all of science. We need reproducible and repeatable experiments. And when you have a validation infrastructure in particular, those have to be repeatable. Um, so that if I run a control experiment in um, you know Tokyo and I run one in Los Angeles, those get the same results if it's the same test bed and the same control architecture. So reproducibility and repeatability is essential. Uh, measure accuracy, of course, uh, we need to actually be able to tell the difference between different control algorithms on different benchmark problems. So we need to um, actually be measuring enough information about the system that we can make good conclusions without changing the course of those experiments. So there's a little bit of that kind of quantum observer uh, flavor to this. You have to be able to measure your system without changing the outcome. And actually in quantum control, that is actually an interesting uh, challenge. And then of course, safe execution uh, is an important thing here. Some of these are things like safe self-driving cars or robotics where even the test bed itself has some kind of you know, risks associated with running these, so you need them to be safe. I, for example, have this double pendulum experiment in my lab, and if it is used incorrectly, it could actually be dangerous. So that's um, you know, important for us to very safely use this as a test bed system. Actually, this is my double pendulum. This is the one that uh, has to be used with care and caution. And this is just one example of a benchmark system. Many, many people across the world have used single pendulum, double pendulum, triple pendulum as you know, toy benchmark systems to test new learning and control algorithms because it's you know, a simple but chaotic nonlinear dynamical system. We know the equations and we can kind of rapidly prototype and play around with this. Um, I'm just actually pointing out here that you know, if I only used as a benchmark system the equation for a double pendulum, and I only did all of my benchmarking in simulation, I would actually miss a lot of the real world complexity because there are there's physics missing from our idealized Lagrangian dynamics, things like wind resistance and bearing chatter. And so you actually need the fidelity of a real experiment um, you know, to capture those discrepancies between the real world and that idealized setting. So remember that fidelity? Sometimes you need an actual hardware test bed to match the fidelity and the kind of challenges you'll see in the real world. This is just one example for my lab. It's kind of a toy system. 
Um, another, so one of the things I really like about this chapter, and I, I learned a lot when I was reading this because I'm very hungry for benchmark systems. My lab works in um, you know learning and machine learning for control. So we're constantly trying to find new benchmark systems where we can go and apply our methods in those benchmark systems. And reading this chapter, I saw dozens of you know data sets and benchmark systems and standards and protocols that I actually hadn't heard of or been aware of. So that's hopefully very useful for you too. You should go read uh, this document and go find those benchmarks and find the one that's useful for you. One of the ones that is pretty common that most of us know about is this OpenAI gym. So before ChatGPT, uh, the fame of large language models, uh, OpenAI was also developing these reinforcement learning benchmark environments, this OpenAI gym, that has things like Atari games or robotic simulations or you know single and double pendula swing up problems. So kind of a, a whole range from toy robotic systems all the way to video game systems where you can um, test your reinforcement learning control algorithms. So this has been really game changing for the reinforcement learning community. And we in the broader controls community need to embrace this kind of very open, very transparent uh, benchmark uh, for our work in the future. Again, um, in my lab, we work a lot in fluid flow control because fluids are everywhere and the ability to control these dramatically will change our ability to, for example, you know, make better efficient cars and trains and trucks and planes, which might have a you know, mitigating effect on, on things like climate change. So flow control is important. Uh, researchers in my group, in particular, Jared Callahan, Ludger Paler, and Sam Onert, have essentially developed this uh, kind of hydro gym benchmark validation environment in the open AI uh, kind of API, the uh, AI gym API, so you can develop controllers and try them on this much harder class of nonlinear fluid flows. Again, just one example, but we as a community, when we have a problem we think is important that we want everyone to work on, we need to be making these validation benchmark uh, systems for people to come together and in a very transparent and open way develop and test technology on the problems we care about. Um, this is a really cool video um, I got from, from uh, one of the organizers, Professor Johansson, one of the organizers of this, um, editors of this, this roadmap, that essentially talks about, you know, if we want um, autonomous vehicles and we want coordination and we want, um, you know, all of these different agents to be working together with autonomy, self-driving cars, things like that, you need to have a, again, flexible validation test bed benchmark system. So this is an example of this um, that I believe is uh, coordinated at least in part by KTH uh, in Stockholm that essentially has this ecosystem test bed for uh, autonomy with different like little self-driving cars. You, there's simulated and real physical assets so you can have you know, different levels of fidelity and complexity and expense. Um, so you can really test lots of uh, control and you know, distributed control, network control, autonomy, all kinds of different algorithms. You can test it in this kind of vehicle traffic control tower. So similar to an air traffic control tower, this is kind of you know, that level of awareness and, um, and fidelity, but for you know, autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And so the ones I showed you before were really toy benchmark systems, very academic. This is the kind of you know, moving more towards real industrial research, the kind of validation and benchmark system that we're gonna need to get those technologies actually into you know, fleets of autonomous, autonomous vehicles. Anyway, I think this video is really cool. Um, you know, I'll, I'll hopefully put a link in the video so you can watch the, the whole thing um, yourself. But hopefully what you've seen is really this um, very high level need, if we want our technology to actually solve these societal scale problems, then we're going to need these validation benchmark uh, infrastructures at various fidelities, at various costs, at various kind of levels of realism so that we can transition that technology into actual, you know, industrial uh, deployment. Okay, thank you.